Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the Surrey Board of Trade this afternoon. I'm Anita Hoverman. I'm CEO of Surrey City Building Business Organization, and I'm also an honorary captain of the Royal Canadian Navy. Thank you for attending today's event that is so critical to the economic foundation, especially as we move forward through this pandemic. Two topics, education and childcare. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the treaty territory of the Tawasan First Nations and the unceded territory of our Coast Salish peoples specifically the Kwatlin, Katsi, and Semiamu First Nations. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Inuit and Métis peoples. I'd also like to say that this upcoming Canada Day is absolutely important to reflect, to listen, and for all of us to be able to move forward together. We of course need to follow health and safety protocols on Canada Day, but it is a time for Canadians to unite with our First Nations, to listen, to learn, to reflect, and not forget, but to move forward. So ladies and gentlemen, events like this do not happen without sponsorship. Thank you so much to our presenting sponsor, Kwantlen Polytechnic University. And our, co our supporting sponsor is Creative Kids Learning Centers. Our business and international trade center sponsors are the law firm of Faskin, the Chambers of Commerce Group Insurance Plan represented by S&F Benefits, BDC, the Business Development Bank of Canada, and Scotiabank. Thank you so much for your ongoing support of the Surrey Board of Trade. Some government officials that are with us this afternoon are Tamara Jansen, Member of Parliament for Cloverdale Langley City, Gary Begg, MLA for Surrey Guilford, Jagru Brar, MLA for Surrey Fleetwood, representing Trevor Halford, MLA for Surrey White Rock, is Effie Cerise, Jenny Sims, MLA for Surrey Panorama, and City of Surrey Councillors Linda Annis, Brenda Locke, and Stephen Pettigrew. Thank you so much for joining us. Just some instructions before we begin. All attendees are muted. Please put your question in the chat function of the Zoom technology. We're also asking media that are on the call to put your questions in the chat function. We're gonna to get to the questions after both presenters. If we're unable to get to your question, we'll send you the answer afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, Surrey is going to be the largest city in British Columbia by 2030. And a third of our population is under the age of 19. We have the greatest number of manufacturers in British Columbia right here in Surrey and human capital, skills development, reskilling, upskilling, all of those pieces are absolutely important to our economy and getting back to doing business. But getting back to doing business also means that our families are supported, that our workforces are supported. And that means quality and ongoing and sustainable investments in childcare. And as you may know, the Surrey Board of Trade, we have been a leader in instigating change at the different levels of government as it relates to childcare, as well as education investments. And uh, even from a federal perspective as well. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so pleased uh, to have with us um, someone who really exemplifies uh, community development, uh, not only related to the Surrey Board of Trade and, and business, but also in terms of community support. And I'm so pleased to welcome first Jenny Hasselfield. She's the Director of Development for Options Community Services to talk about an amazing affordable housing project to support our families. Ginny, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Anita. And, uh, and thank you to uh, Surrey Board of Trade for allowing me a couple of minutes today to talk to you about options community services. I am looking forward to hearing from Minister Whiteside and Minister Chen. And uh, obviously, uh, options community services is very interested in uh, children and uh, everything that's related to children. And so uh, I look forward to hearing the speakers later on. Uh, options community services is not well known by the wider community of Langley, Delta, Surrey, South Surrey, White Rock, and it's not well known by uh, those who don't use its services. Uh, I don't know how many of you would know that we have approximately 550 staff. We have 88 programs that we run, and some of those programs that Options run uh, are transition houses. We have the Bill Reed Shelter in Cloverdale. We have Highland House. We have the Fraser Health Crisis Line. We have mental health programs for children who are autistic. Uh, we have moms and babies programs, youth programs, and employment programs for immigrants and refugees. And I was so thrilled when I started working with Options to see the breadth and scope of the services that they do offer. And about three years ago, they asked their clients what was their most pressing need. And almost all of the clients said their most pressing need was affordable housing. So Options, who had really never been into the development of housing builds or anything like that, decided to put in an application to BC Housing and to the federal government and anybody else who uh, was housing related uh, to try and get funding to help build an affordable housing complex. And they were lucky enough to receive the funding. And um, our commitment was that um, on behalf of uh, Options Community Services, we had to raise $1.5 million. Well, as you can imagine, fundraising during the pandemic wasn't a lot of fun, uh, wasn't going to be a lot of fun. And so in February of this year, uh, we had created an idea called the Women of Options. And we asked 50 women from the South Fraser if they would consider helping us to raise $25,000 each towards our $1.5 million goal. We had already received uh, $250,000 from uh, Surrey Homelessness and Housing Society. And we had uh, commitments from some of our board members and others uh, so that we really did have to just raise about 1.2. Um, I'm happy to say that at this point, we have raised almost all of the money that we needed. Um, we are $49,000 short and our campaign is not over yet until the end of the month. Uh, we are hoping that people will support us and um, if they are interested uh, to do so, uh, they could go to womenofoptions.ca uh, look for any one of the 50 women, including Anita Huberman from the Board of Trade, and click on that link and, uh, and help us by um, putting some funds into our affordable housing initiative, which will be taking place at King George and 81st. Uh, we're calling it Habitat at 81st because our sister society Habitat uh, is very involved with this as well. Um, we also um, are going to make sure that 70% of this affordable housing build is uh, focused at affordable housing itself. The other 30% is market rates. On the bottom two floors, we will have programs for children, programs and services, um, healthy babies, for example, uh, mental health services, so that the whole two floors in the lower part of this six story building uh, will be services. And we think it'll be um, a great opportunity for people in Surrey to uh, both attend and uh, get involved with, um, with this project. In addition to this, um, I would like also to say that um, we are planning a fiesta in the fall and we are calling it a virtual um, Mexican fiesta. We know that there was a pent up demand for everybody to travel and we weren't sure whether or not we'd be able to travel in November yet, but hopefully we will. Uh, we're having a virtual fiesta and I'd just like you to know that we are looking for sponsors for that fiesta. We are offering two uh, free tickets uh, to Mexico for seven days as part of our fiesta uh, excitement and extravaganza. And um, I think that the focus for that fiesta will be the raising of funds for the um, office furniture in the building in those two floors. So even though we have just about completed one very successful campaign, 
we're already on to the next and uh, I look forward to the support that we have received from the city of Surrey and the Surrey community and the wider community of Delta, Langley, Abbotsford and, and all of the, uh, the outlying areas um, in the lower mainland. So thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to give you a quick overview of our, um, our services and of our campaign. And we look forward to seeing everybody in the fall at our virtual fiesta. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much, Jenny. And I'm proud to say that I've exceeded my $25,000 goal. And uh, thank you so much to Options for including me as part of your fundraising initiative and the Board of Trade. And uh, best of luck to you. We're with you and supporting you all the way. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our presenting sponsor, Dr. Alan Davis from Kwantlen Polytechnic University. He's also the Vice Chancellor of KPU. Alan, over to you. Thank you, Anita. I'm speaking to you from today from the traditional and ancestral lands of the Semiamu First Nation. A special hello to Ministers Whiteside and Chen, and I'm pleased that the Surrey Board of Trade is actively involved in elevating the pressing need for increased access to quality childcare in our region. It's truly in an investment in our collective future. At KPU, we recognize that to make the world a better place, access to lifelong meaningful education for all is fundamental. The early learning years are vital and, and quality childcare and early learning go hand in hand. And this is where our continuum of a lifetime of learning should get its solid, its solid foundation. And that is why KPU is examining now how we might support the provincial government's goal of developing new skills training and career opportunities in the area of early childhood education. We look forward to working with government on this critical area for our province and I thank the Surrey Board of Trade for making time today for this very important discussion. Thanks, Anita. Thank you so much, Ellen. And I know KPU, uh, they are going to be resuming classes uh, this fall. And I know they're excited about welcoming our youth back and their students back. And certainly, this has been a challenging time for all of us, uh, but especially our schools uh, in the K-12 sector, but also our post-secondary, all of our schools. So best of luck to you. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our first speaker today. Uh, she is uh, the BC Minister of Education at the forefront of the pandemic she was. Please help me welcome Minister Jennifer Whiteside. Jennifer. Thank you so much. I'm just, we'll get my notes up here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Whiteside. I'm the MLA for New Westminster, and I have the privilege of serving as BC's Minister of Education. And I'm joining you this afternoon from the traditional territory of the Kakite First Nation and Coast Salish peoples on the banks of the beautiful Fraser River. Thank you so much, Anita, members of the uh, Surrey Board of Trade and the local business community for having me here today. And I'm very excited to be joined virtually by my uh, colleague and friend, Katrina Chen, BC's Minister of State for Child Care. And just to uh, also acknowledge uh, a few others in the in the odd in, in attendance today. I know we, uh, uh, as you mentioned, Anita, have, have Tamara Jansen, MP for Clover, Cloverdale Langley City. Uh, my colleagues, Gary Begg, MLA for Surrey Guilford, Jenny Sims, uh, MLA for Surrey Panorama. I believe Jagrup Brar, uh, MLA for Surrey Fleetwood is here as well. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to virtually be in space with the Surrey City Councillors. And I do want to send a special hello to representatives from the BC Principals and Vice Principals Associations and everyone attending through uh, from, uh, from school districts throughout the, the province. And of course, thank you to, uh, today to all of your sponsors who made this, uh, this really important uh, discussion possible. It, uh, it's a real pleasure to be speaking to, uh, to people in Surrey today and to, to have the opportunity to tell you about some of the amazing progress that we are making to provide better educational experiences for students across this beautiful community. 
Over the last four years, our government has developed a strong relationship with the Surrey School Board and the City of, of Surrey. We have worked together through our Surrey Project Office to accelerate investments in schools with a shared goal to make investments that give more students the opportunity, opportunity to learn in classrooms, not in portables. Over that time, we've invested $450 million in Surrey schools, which are helping to add nearly 9,600 new student seats between 2018 and 2025. And we know that families are seeing the results of these efforts right now. In fact, three brand new schools opened this year alone, and there are more to come. I, I do want to just send a big shout out and a big thank you to everyone here today who has invested their time, talents, and resources into this moment today and this vitally important topic that we're here to, to talk about, supporting child, uh, child care, early learning, and education in BC's economy. But I think I just would be, be remiss in not acknowledging that the past year, of course, has been a, a struggle for uh, all of us in our, in our communities. And uh, the road has, of the pandemic has certainly been unpredictable, but there are so many encouraging signs of uh, improvement, and especially right here. Over 75% of British Columbians have received uh, the first dose of their vaccine. That is very promising. Our vaccination rates are extraordinary, the best among the best on, on the continent. And that means of course, that we are getting closer to opening up BC. That's especially exciting news for many businesses throughout the, the, the province. It's also a very exciting time in our province right now as uh, school is finishing up for so many students. And the end of the school year, of course, means families will be looking to travel, to support local businesses, to uh, support attractions throughout uh, both at home and, and throughout BC communities. With the school year ending, it, it also signals uh, a huge milestone for so many grade 12 students who have recently graduated. And I, I, I wanna just pause for a moment to say congratulations to the incredible graduating class of 2021 who pushed through an extraordinary year, an historic year, graduated during a pandemic. Uh, and I'm happy to share that uh, the news that, that students, families, teachers and staff are, are planning for a near normal return to school in September. And it is uh, really thanks to the incredible work of educators, administrators, trustees, school staff, everyone across our education system that, we're, that we were able to complete this year uh, uh, so successfully and are, are planning for a successful start again in, in September. So we know that with the successful rollout of our vaccine, uh, vaccination program, uh, we know that uh, uh, students can be looking forward to learning um, in class, sort of full-time in class, no learning cohorts. We will, of course, have uh, safety plans in place. Uh, and uh, uh, if anyone was following the announcement last week on our school restart for September, the province uh, will be providing a total of $43.6 million to support enhanced cleaning measures, support First Nations and Métis students, uh, uh, support uh, mental health services, and also to uh, you know, assess and respond to learning impacts um, that students may have experienced and keeping some of the mechanisms that we've had in place that have really supported our school system throughout this year. As always, we will continue to work uh, under the direction of our public health experts with our provincial K-12 uh, education steering committee over the summer as we finalize plans and guidelines to best support the health and safety of students and staff for the next school year. I, I'd say though that, that one huge takeaway, of course, from, from our experience this year is, is that the pandemic has really highlighted just how critical early learning and childcare is for children, families, and for our economic recovery. So improving access to childcare creates more opportunities for parents, particularly mothers, to go back to work or school and provides children with the best possible start in life. And as we look to the future, bringing childcare and early learning together under the Ministry of Education with our K-12 sector is an important step to support government's long-term plan to create a universal, inclusive, early learning 
early care and learning system. And that's why I'm so excited that the child care portfolio will join the Ministry of Education uh, by 2023. And the new, this new integrated system will better support children and families and inspire lifelong learning. Later this summer, we'll be starting a formal engagement process as we continue to build the first new social program in a generation. And through this engagement, we'll be listening to and learning from all of our partners across the child care and early learning and education uh, systems to better understand all of the considerations that we need to, to understand, including workforce considerations, um, as, we, uh, as we lay out the, the steps for, the, for, the, for uh, the development of uh, the future development of our child care and early learning system. Uh, we, we will be working closely with child care providers, municipalities, school boards, as we build our system. What we do know is that this change will make life better for children and families. Children will be living and learning in a much more seamless system of care, early learning, and K-12 education. It will make life easier for parents, reducing the number of trips and drop-offs and handoffs that they have to make uh, throughout their day. And of course, this is also about uh, economic growth. For parents to succeed uh, in their work, they have to feel confident knowing that their children are well cared for when they drop them off in the morning. And I'd like to mention um, a Conference Board of Canada report from 2017, the Ready for Life report, which explores the impact of early uh, childhood education on Canada's economy and highlights its potential to improve socioeconomic outcomes. And this report shows that expanding early childhood education in Canada would increase female labor market participation, improve child outcomes, especially for disadvantaged children, and reduce Canada's income inequality. By allowing more women to enter the labor force, the introduction of an expanded early childhood education program would result in about 23,000 families many of them single parent families being lifted out of poverty. And given the substantial positive benefits to society and the economy, clearly there's a very strong case to make for expanding early childhood education services. And uh, Deloitte also recently released a report uh, that outlined the case for large scale investment in early learning and childcare. And that report said that while investments in early learning and childcare can be an ideal source of economic stimulus for the current pandemic, they can also put Canada on the path to stronger, more resilient and inclusive economic growth. That I think is more proof that we are absolutely on the right track in here, uh, uh, here in BC. And that's why supporting early care and learning for our youngest learners is a top priority for our government. A child's early years are the foundation of their development, providing a strong base for lifelong learning, including their cognitive and social emotional development. And our government is investing in child care now more than ever before in order to support BC families. Of course, my, my, my colleague Katrina Chen will cover much more of this uh, in uh, of the exciting, much more of the exciting developments for child care in BC. But, just want to take a moment to highlight some of the, 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 the particular initiatives that we've been working on together. As part of our work in education with the Ministry of Children and Family Development to ensure quality child care services are available to families, we've created up to 1,200 new child care spaces in schools by funding neighborhood learning centers at 25 newer replacement schools since uh, September 2017. The Ministry of Education will also be expanding the Seamless Day pilot program from four locations to 24 locations. And this expansion will benefit families in accessing more early care and learning on school grounds and will integrate school age care programs into kindergarten and grade one classrooms. And our budget 2021 adds an extra $1.3 million to help families with accessing more care on school grounds. 
to prepare for the move of the child care program to the Ministry of Education. We're also working with school districts to make sure that they have the supports they need to increase capacity so that they can play a stronger role in providing early care and learning services, including partnering with care providers. We've introduced legislation to make it easier for school districts to deliver uh, before and after school care on school property. And our record school capital budget is allowing us to continue adding new spaces at neighborhood learning centers as part of our plan to build, expand, and replace schools in every corner of BC. All of these steps that our government is taking will support the work ahead as the province continues to engage with partners from the childcare and education sectors including, importantly, Indigenous-led child care providers and right, rights holders to continue to build an inclusive early care and learning system to move BC even further along the path to universal child care. You know, we, we know that parents are busy and simplifying early care and learning options uh, is going to ease so much stress and pressure for families. I'm committed to working with government and all of our education and early learn care and learning partners to continue to put families first by working in partnership with local municipalities, indigenous governments, not-for-profits, school districts, and other partners. We are creating early care and learning spaces that meet the unique needs of communities across our province. Our government is committed to supporting student learning from the very early years to grade 12 and beyond. We know that when our children succeed, our communities succeed and our whole province succeeds. So thank you very much for, uh, for having me here today. And I look forward to hearing from my colleague, Minister Chen, and then having a chance for some questions. Thank you so much, Minister Whiteside. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome uh, the BC Minister of State for Child Care, the Honourable Katrina Chen. Katrina, over to you. Thank you so much, Anita, and it's great to uh, be able to have this opportunity to connect with many Surrey Board of Trade members and community members and really appreciate the opportunity uh, for me to be here joining my colleague, Minister Weissheit. As um, Minister Weissheit has said, we'll be working really closely, well, we have been working closely with education uh, to pave this journey to really bring closer to the zero to five services uh, before and after school care services and K to 12 education together to really focus on the child as a whole. And before I begin, of course, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking here from the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people from my community office here in Burnaby. Um, and really great to know that there's so many people on this call and joining this very important conversation about, you know, really building the, the foundation of our society through public education, through childcare. And before I dive in a bit more to talk about childcare, I do really want to give a big shout out to Surrey Board of Trade and also specifically to Anita as well for your leadership um, in always showcasing and promoting the importance of investing in early learning and care and how that really connects to our economy. And as Minister Weissai has already said, there's so many uh, data and proof to show how investing in early learning is so crucial and has a significant economic return that every dollar you invest in can get you know, more than $6 return to our economy and how that's really building a strong foundation for our society. And when I was traveling across the province in 2018, 19, well, before the pandemic and promoting and encouraging people to really think about the importance of investment in childcare. Uh, I remember that Surrey Board of Trade was one of the organizations that I did not really need to spend too much time convincing because you already did report, you were already advocating for investment in childcare, and you are really one of the leaders and business communities that have been always been talking about the importance of childcare. And I really thank you for that because. We all know how investing in childcare is great for our young children, for their early learning needs as their brain develops the fastest before the age of five. Those are crucial years to build a strong foundation for those children's future. It's great for families so parents can have the option to return to work, to pursue their career or educational goals, to be able to continue to be contributing members in our society and have the choice to be able to raise young families in, in BC. 
it's great for our economy as employers, uh, many of you and community members are really struggling to retain and recruit workers um, when the cost of living is so high in DC. Um, investing in early learning is critical to ensure that we have a healthy workforce and um, skill workers who are able to contribute to our local economy. And I'm very honored to have the opportunity to serve as the Minister of State, uh, starting the work in 2017 to build a new social program. Uh, this is going to be a historical program, a first social program that BC has uh, uh, done in decades, uh, that this is going to be a new program that will benefit generations to come. And when I started this work, I have to be honest, uh, I was simply a mom who struggled with childcare. Um, with the cost of childcare, with not being able to find a space for my young child. And I know my struggle was not alone. There's thousands and tons of parents across BC communities not able to return to work, not be able to um, have the options to raise your family in BC or some parents, uh, like Minister Weissai has mentioned. I've met some single parents who had to struggle uh, with making the ends meet, giving up their career, living below the poverty line because they could not find childcare solutions. And at the time when I started this work, there was no system at all. There was very little investment into the sector. Um, there's no coordinated approach. And I remember I would always be looking at the gaps and the problems and the struggles of childcare providers, early childhood educators and families. And I was thinking, how come the government has never put a focus on early learning and care? And even until now, uh, we've done a lot during the past three and a half years to accelerate the creation of space, to make childcare more affordable, which we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the investments that we've done during the past three and a half years, and also at the same time supporting the workforce, early childhood educators, providers. Um, but childcare continues to be a challenge for some families. And even for my personal experience as a working parent and an immigrant without families, other family members here, uh, even this week, I was thinking about, oh my gosh, school break is going to come up. How do I deal with my son's school break? What activity should I sign him up for? And some of you uh, may have seen me at different events with my sonning, son running around in the background uh, doing Zoom meetings because I cannot find childcare solutions. And I often have to count on amazing childcare providers before and after school care, amazing friends who have to provide that support and help from time to time. And my personal experience constantly reminds me the importance of how we need to continue to push and build this system, no matter how challenging it could be to build a new social program here, because too many families are still waiting for those uh, solutions. And, but we've accomplished a lot during the, the past few years. Um, and we definitely have definitely more work to do, but we've learned a lot since we started this work in 2017. And then in 2018, uh, in a few months, we put together a childcare BC plan with over $1.3 billion new funding uh, in our budget. And currently over the past few years, we've been already invested over $2 billion uh, into the childcare system um, to make sure uh, we can build a systematic approach. Again, we need to walk away from patchwork. It has to be a new system for BC families. And that is why in a short period of time, we've already rolled out over three dozens of new strategies and the number continues to grow. Actually, uh, I need to do a recounting because during a pandemic, we wrote out new strategies. Um, I remember our temporary emergency funding was done in a week with millions of dollars going into providers. Uh, and we were the only jurisdiction in whole Canada to provide support, not just to providers who are open to serve essential services workers, but also providers who were closed because of the pandemic to ensure that whenever they're ready, they can come back and continue to serve BC families. And during the past three and a half short years uh, that we have already accelerated the space creation. Uh, this is the fastest space creation we've ever had in BC. Uh, the government uh, has supported and funded uh, nearly 26,000 spaces with 70% of the spaces expected to be open in the coming year. And this is really the fastest in BC's history with government support. And I also want to give a shout out to a lot of providers across BC communities, including many providers in Surrey, who have partnered with us, including indigenous communities, public sector, school district, local providers, small, medium-sized uh, family providers who have joined our program and have worked with government to ensure every single week we are seeing new childcare spaces serving BC families uh, across our province. And we need to continue to make sure childcare is more affordable. This all go hand in hand together. 
that families have been struggling to afford childcare costs. And the cost of childcare can be way more expensive than a family's mortgage, rent payment, and it could be a huge burden on a family's finance. And that is why a lot of parents, especially mothers, uh, have sacrificed and cannot continue their work because of their childcare struggle. And I'm excited to hear the government, federal government now is talking about a national child care plan. We've been advocating for a national child care plan for years. And now uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to partner with the federal government to bring affordable child care to more families. But just during the past three and a half years, provincial government alone with our investment, we've already brought $10 a day child care to tens and thousands of families. Uh, and we have three different measures, income tested, non-income tested, the prototype $10 a day site, um, and families now can save up to $1,600 per month for their child care cost. Some of the families who are really struggling to return to work because their income may not be able to even cover their child care costs can get little or no cost child care at all. And that is important because we want to make sure parents have the option to be able to return to work and contribute to our economy. But we cannot build a system without early childhood educators and providers who have worked so hard in this sector for years with the lack of support, low wages, and very, again, very little investment into the sector. So we have rolled out over a dozen of strategies to looking at how can we enhance and support their wage? How can we provide bursary programs to ensure there's more early childhood educators coming into the field? How do we provide ongoing workforce support? And that includes uh, this year, we have announced that we will raise our wage enhancement program to $4 an hour uh, wage enhancement starting in September. And that will be a huge uh, boost to a lot of early childhood educators hourly wages, but this is only the beginning. This is not the end. We need to make sure we continue to work together to build a well-supported workforce. And for your information, this is a workforce that has 97% of women working as early childhood educators. It is really a gender equity issue as we need to continue to make sure that more women and more early childhood educators uh, have better compensation as they're looking after really our most important um, babies in our lives. We are uh, you know, allowing um, our babies to be with someone that we don't know and under the care of an early childhood educator. We need to better support those early childhood educators. And at the same time, we need to make sure childcare is more inclusive, especially for communities like Surrey with diverse needs, with indigenous population. We need to make sure there's more indigenous led childcare, culturally inclusive childcare and childcare that serves diverse needs of parents and families and also children who require extra support. Um, we need to continue, we continue, sorry, we need to continue to make sure that we provide the crucial support to those families and children with diverse needs. So there's much more work to do. We've only uh, gone to the fourth year of our 10 year plan and we need to continue to build a new social program for BC families. And we know the pandemic has really hit the sector really hard. And there may be some providers on this call that I do wanna thank you and really want to give a big shout out to all the early childhood educators and providers who have been working so hard on the front line, supporting the health and safety of your centers supporting families to return to work, especially essential services workers. We know that um, we have been working closely together with the sector and I thank a lot of partners like Surrey Board of Trade and it was really good to also hear from Surrey Options as one of our major partners as well, uh, local providers and organizations that we've been learning from to make sure we can adjust the, uh, along the way of our programs and making sure we're learning together. And we are really committed to work with the diverse sector to respond to the needs of parents, to respond to the needs of early childhood educators. And as we're building a new social program, I want to assure you that we will continue to work with the diverse sector, whether if you are a small family childcare provider, you're a medium-sized childcare provider, we have had a lot of success working with early childhood educators and providers, including, for example, our fee reduction program that brings down the cost of childcare up to $350 per month, not income tested, we currently have 90% of providers across BC communities to join this program. And we wanna continue that work together as we build a new system. And in the coming weeks and months and years, actually, uh, I know our government and community members will be focusing on the economic recovery. We will continue to invest in other important public infrastructures, not just public education, childcare, but healthcare, seniors, helping small business to grow and hire build the infrastructure that we need to strengthen our communities and helping 
uh, promising business uh, BC businesses to scale up, including our government's uh, 500 million strategic investment funds that will position our province as a front runner in the post pandemic economy. And today, uh, many of you may have heard that BC uh, has enlisted a global expert, Mariana uh, Muscato, and her team from the University College London's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose to support BC on developing sustainable, innovative, inclusive economic plan. And this is really an exciting time. We know there are a lot of challenges ahead, but challenges often bring us opportunities as well. So we will continue to seek input and learn from BC business groups, labor, indigenous uh, communities, post-secondary institutions, not-for-profit organizations, local governments, providers, and the public together. And many of you have already seen how important childcare is to our local community. And I look forward to today's conversation and continue to learn from you and also working with my colleagues, including Minister Weissai and many of the MOAs on this call to make sure we continue to build a new social program for BC families. Thank you, and I look forward to today's discussion. Thank you so much. And Minister Whiteside, if you can turn your camera on. Ministers, there's a variety of questions that I have for you, and I just uh, ask you to answer them very succinctly so we can get through as many questions as possible. Minister Whiteside, my first question is to you. Uh, tell us your perspective about portables in Surrey, are we actually going to get rid of them or are they here to stay? Uh, well, th thanks for that question. And I, um, I'm i really pleased to say that I, for the first time, I believe it was last year, the Surrey School District did not need to purchase any new portables and they won't be purchasing any portables this year. Uh, we have, our government has made record investments in um, capital. Uh, investments in our schools to build new schools, to build additions, to seismically upgrade schools. And we have been working very closely uh, through our project office in Surrey with the Surrey School District and the city of Surrey to coordinate all of that capital, capital development. So the plan for Surrey, which is um, represented uh, through a uh, and I just want to get the number right here because it's an important number. It's a, a $454 million investment in Surrey to fund uh, 9,600 new seats, many of which have been delivered. And the time period for that is from 2018 to 2025. So we are on track to, uh, to address the, uh, the use of portables in, uh, in Surrey and get kids in uh, learning into, uh, in, in, in classrooms. Thank you. Minister Chen. What is going to happen with the private child care sector from your perspective? Are there plans to bridge early learning with the Ministry of Education and the K-12 children? Definitely. Uh, actually, recently, uh, we've sent out a drawing letter along with Minister Weissite and the MCFD Minister, Minister Ding, together to assure that all providers, diverse providers in BC <clears throat> because we do have a very diverse sector. I've learned so much about how many different ways people are running childcare centers, staff are being paid differently, uh, how different type of operations in our province that we definitely want to make sure we continue to work with diverse providers to meet the diverse needs of BC families. We will welcome everybody to join the new system. And I just gave an example of our fee reduction program. Now currently have 90% of providers joining this program, which is a huge success. And we definitely want to continue to learn from everybody in the coming weeks and months, actually during the summertime, we will be sending out information to engage with providers. And if anyone has any feedback, thoughts or questions, uh, they can definitely send us an email and we're more than happy to work with providers to ensure we can all go into a new system, new program and welcome everybody to join this new program. I think some of the challenges that some of the attendees are articulating in the chat is that our schools are so full and uh, we have a thousand plus students uh, that start session after Labor Day each and every year uh, beyond goals, beyond expectations. Do you think there is actually space in the schools? Uh, is there sustainability mechanisms? Uh, what's your perspective on that, Minister Whiteside? Well, thank you, Anita. And, and again, just to, to say that we, uh, you know, since 2017, uh, we have invested 
um, uh, significant uh, made significant investments in in capital funding to 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 build schools. And I, I'd say that in Surrey in particular, you know, we saw very little investment um, in um, in uh, in years prior to that. We have uh, uh, overall uh, our our budget 2021 makes a 3.2 billion dollar investment across the entire province. Uh, what we're looking to do with, uh, with with Surrey is continue the very fast pace of development that we have um, that we've had in Surrey, where we have um, uh, delivered on um, uh, uh, numerous projects, four hundred and fifty million dollars to dollars to deliver ninety six hundred seats, and those those seats uh, are equivalent to three hundred and eighty five portables, which is actually higher than the number of portables that is that that's currently in use. So I know that we are in Surrey is a very fast growing community and we're in a game of really having to try and keep pace with the with the growth. I know that we have um, uh, some facilities, uh, some schools in Surrey that 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 are over capacity, some that were um, that that are not. And we are working every year with um, with uh, with the district and with the, the city to bring online new elementary schools that help take pressure away uh, and make sure that we are uh, uh, ha having enough elementary schools to feed into the uh, into into the middle and secondary schools. So it is um, it, there's no question that it's a challenge to keep up with the incredible growth that's happening in Surrey. But we I think uh, that 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 you would hear this from the district and from uh, from the city as well that the model we have of development in Surrey is um, has is really really efficient. It uh, we have the city working together on making sure they're they're involved. Involved in in terms of permitting, in terms of uh, issues around identifying sites uh, to build future schools. I mean, we are we are planning very far out in uh, in Surrey, anticipating the growth that's that's going to come. So it uh, it's uh, it's been a very good news story in Surrey, and that that's that is what's going to continue for the coming years. Minister Whiteside, uh, another question for you is: What is your perspective? on redesigning the curriculum in the K-12 sector in consultation with Indigenous populations uh, to really ensure that uh, our kids are learning about the history, the realities, and, and learning from Indigenous uh, and, and First Nations uh, groups. You know, Anita, that's such an important uh, question, and per particularly now as we um, are still uh, grappling with the uh, with uh, with the discovery in in Kamloops, while we are coming just off of uh, uh, National um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday. This is not this is you know National Indigenous uh, Peoples Month this month. We have a we're going to have a complicated. Uh, we have a complicated relationship to Canada Day that's being expressed and there's a very important discussion I think happening right now amongst British Columbians around how we how we deal with this, how we talk about it, how we how we grapple with it. And I very much appreciated your comments um, acknowledging that at the at the beginning of this this session. Uh, what I think we should be very um, proud of in, in British Columbia is that we do have a new curriculum that educators who are um, uh, maybe tuning in will will know about that's been implemented gradually over the over the last few years, and in which uh, the 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 many of the the calls to action related to education and the and the development of um, the inclusion of. Uh, ways of, of his, not just history, but of Aboriginal peoples, but ways of knowing uh, the history of residential schools. That material is actually in, uh, in, in the curriculum. So we are, at, and we work very closely with um, our colleagues at the First Nations Education Steering Committee. Um, we work with rights holders uh, in, with respect to developing the content. And I do want to just take a moment to really give a shout out to, to our two BC's educators, to the BC Teachers Federation, who has done in, in incredible work in, um, in developing uh, this content, in advocating for its inclusion in schools, in creating uh, standards with the teachers council uh, around um, an expectation and a commitment that educators will uh, will will teach this uh, teach this content, there is of course much work to be done around uh, in terms of supporting um, our educators to uh, to to work with that that content, uh, doing much more around. Um, uh, 
uh, First Nations languages, for example, that's a very impo important part of what we need to do in terms of, of integrating First Nations culture and languages into, into schools. We're doing very well in some areas and there's, there's much more that we need to do. So I, I'd say that it's definitely a, <clears throat> it's an ongoing journey, but it's a, it's a journey in which we are taking the lead from uh, Indigenous people. We're taking the lead from our rights holders. Uh, we are working very closely with educators and uh, we will continue to do uh, the work that needs to be done to, um, to build in, to, to respond to the calls of action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you for that. Minister Chen, uh, women have really been compromised during <clears throat> pandemic and uh, and sometimes uh, men have been uh, compromised as a result of the pandemic they're responsible uh, for taking care of the children I, I'm just wondering you know we are back to pre-pandemic times where uh, entering the workforce for women um, remains such a significant challenge we're back to the 90s according to an RBC report when will families be able to access $10 a day care, uh, $10 a day uh, child care in British Columbia? Definitely, I always say that child care is also a gender equity issue because vast majority of women have been carrying the responsibility of child care as, as we all know. And uh, the access is so important that we need to continue to create more spaces in BC. And that is why since 2017 and 18, uh, we have been funding and supporting the creation of more childcare spaces. I'm really excited that really every week, every single month, we are seeing more spaces that we have funded during the past few years being <coughs> created in BC communities. Um, we have uh, supported the creation of close to 26,000 and 70% of them will become in operation in the coming year. So we're excited for those opportunities, but at the same time, continue to build a new social program. Again, this is a systematic approach. We have to build a new system to ensure childcare can be more affordable. $10 a day childcare for more BC families, for sure. We're gonna continue to expand uh, the prototype site, but at the same time, we have two other measures, the fee reduction program and the affordable childcare benefit. That's already bringing $10 a day to many families that are saving up to $1,600,000 per month. And we're gonna see that work being expended along with the national child care plan. We are in active conversation with our federal uh, counterpart right now uh, to ensure we can get the federal dollars as the federal government has promised to bring a national child care system that BC wants to be one of the first province to be able to start this work and ensure that more families are gonna see their fees being reduced in the coming year. And there's a lot of exciting uh, work that's being worked in the background and we can wait to share more, but at the same time, we have not slowed down our plan. This year, we provincially, we have already budgeted for more expansion of 10 a day site, and we hope to continue to expand affordability measures to more families in BC. So no specific date just yet, is that correct? I think it's important to remind everyone we're building a new system and a lot of families, already 10, 10 of family have already see their fee went down. Uh, we did a comparison from 2017 to 18, that fee has already gone down in this province uh, for childcare and thousands of families have received $10 a day. So we're gonna see more expansion and it's a 10 year plan. We're into our fourth year with the federal partnership, we're hoping, of course, that, that this could go as fast as possible. But I would expect that in the coming months, more and more families will be benefiting from more $10 a day services. And we absolutely need more early childhood educators as well. There has to be a specific training focus related to that, uh, to get more of that human capital into the labor market. My last question is to Minister Whiteside. And uh, you know, there's so many job openings that are going to be happening even despite the pandemic. By 2030, I believe there's going to be another 1.3 million job openings, many of them in the trades. How is um, perhaps uh, the high school students working with uh, post-secondary institutions like Portland Polytechnic University to really bridge uh, industry needs to curriculum development and also labor needs and to really build that culture in a very diverse community that we have 
that trades matter. Uh, they're good quality jobs. Um, but we also need that uh, experience, those partnerships uh, with post-secondary and the business community. That, uh, thanks, Anita. That's a, that's a great question because I'm actually, I'm very interested in issues around labor force uh, development. And I think that um, the trades have a particularly important, um, impl important place in um, in how we think about um, career options, particularly for kids coming out of uh, coming out of high school, and I think as you probably know, we have um, a career strategy in in K to twelve that um, where where students can take dual credit programs where they where they're exposed to trades um, uh, if they have that that inclination throughout high school, and I just I have to say you know I just you know education doesn't look anything how like it did when I went to high school I had a chance to tour the new um, uh, high school in my in my in my writing in New Westminster uh, er, earlier this year and the uh, the facilities for um, for uh, for for trades uh, for the you know for the shop classes and whatnot are really remarkable I think educators and, and school districts are doing a really remarkable job in um, in, in demonstrating and providing the full sort of range of options for kids with respect to what their what their future careers can can be uh, a very important um, element of this is the is work we do very collaboratively with uh, with uh, my colleague um, uh, Minister King and the um, uh, uh, Minister of, of Advanced Education and Skills Training. And you may have 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 caught as well in the last in the last few weeks and that uh, that we just have have announced a, um, a a change in approach to how we're certifying trades, which is really a return to improving the sort of the quality and the the and the baseline for uh, for trades and really investing in uh, what it means to have a, a red seal, which is uh, which is an important uh, marker of, uh, of of quality in in the trades. So I'm very excited about that work because I think. I think those kinds of developments where we're really valuing the important uh, work and uh, and quality and qualifications of, of those jobs, uh, I think that that will lead to um, more kids thinking that those are really um, important, you know, viable uh, options for them uh, in the future. And we're going to need them. We're going to need lots of trades, just like we're going to need lots of early childhood uh, educators. Uh, we know that we have a, I mean, we have a very vibrant economy. We have a caring economy where we really need to be also, um, you know, making sure that we're focusing on all of those diverse elements. And as uh, as um, as Minister Chen mentioned, we have some outside expertise to help our government um, kind of craft a plan and navigate some of those really challenging um, um, and interesting and fabulous opportunities that we're going to have. Minister Whiteside, Minister Chen, thank you so much for being with us and thank you uh, for your service to British Columbia and uh, for the work that both of you have done during this pandemic, a very challenging time uh, for you, uh, for government and for all of us. There are so many more questions to ask. We're gonna send them to you and then obtain the answers for our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you to our presenting sponsor, Kwantlen Polytechnic University, our supporting sponsor, Creative Kids Learning Centers. And tomorrow, June 24th, is our digital town hall event on the forestry industry in Surrey. And then in the summer, we have a variety of events uh, including ones with Ed Fast, Canada's finance critic, BC's Green Party leader, Sonia Forstenow, and BC's Minister of Agriculture, Lana Popham. Ladies and gentlemen, make it a great business day.